Hey everyone, um, just a quick Friday the 13th sort of uh, quick Facebook Live. Who knows if it'll be quick or not. Um, but I am on this beautiful lake in Michigan, but it's like super rainy and cold outside, so you can't even see it. But I wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about why we've been talking about bagging behavior charts. And this is actually going to turn into um, a podcast episode because so many people are like, well, do you mean, and what about, and if I do this, is it okay? And so I thought maybe we just need to like jump on and talk about it once and for all and explain sort of what do I mean by a behavior chart? Why am I and many others suggesting that we bag it? And then of course we can admire the problem for a long time, but how do we find a solution? So, um, as I always say, kind of a spoiler alert, the solution is not easy and it's not for, you know, the faint of heart. So hang in there with me. It's so wonderful to see so many um, revolutionaries that are my dear, dear friends jumping on. Feel free to comment as well um, things that you've seen in the use or the misuse of behavior charts. But let's just start with what do I mean by a behavior chart? Why am I saying that we should bag them? And it's not just think about um, doing something differently. So we still have the issue. There's really oftentimes a positive intention about why we're using the behavior charts. It kind of goes bad quickly, but oftentimes we're starting from a really good place. So let's start with what do I mean by a behavior chart? Um, because sometimes people like to keep things sort of like on track. And I may have a wonky um, internet connection, but I'm just going to keep going and hopefully that something is salvageable in the end. So First of all, is this um, chart, clip, even if it's a unicorn, is it displayed publicly so that people can see it? And then I'm going to add a twist to this. Can you hear it? So if I say, hey, I like the way that Pam is sitting, and wow, Shelly looks ready to learn. I'm going to include that in my Bannett list. So. It's this public announcement of somebody else's behavior, okay? So that's pretty far-reaching, and I'm not just making um, this claim that we should bag these visual displays, but I'm also going a step further, many of us have, that we also need to be very careful about our words and that are we creating division or are we creating community? So I'll come back to that in a minute. But generally speaking, my first general rule of, do you really mean, does it include, can I use... If it's public, be very, very cautious. And if that stop, then we need to be also very cautious. So in a minute, we'll come back to, but what about, we are a PBIS, we're doing a school-wide intervention. Don't I have to do? We'll come back to that in just a minute. But because one size does not fit all when it comes to uh, learning how to self-regulate and become a member of the community, the second criteria is if your behavior chart is designed for everybody, it also gets to hit the road. Number three, if it's highly symbolic. So today in blue now, and then they say, well, what about the zones of regulation? There's yellow in that, and can't there be a purple? Okay, I'm rambling about all these colors because if we as adults, many of us who've been, you know, 25 more than once, if we still can't figure out the symbolic representation or the symbolic nature of the system, how do we expect two-year-olds and three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds to figure out that red is bad and green is good and yellow is good, better than good and really good? Like, I don't know what those are, but you know what I mean. Um, no, still not okay because it's still public. It's still class-wide, and it's still highly symbolic, and all you've done is try to like put a Midwestern sweetness to it by really still saying it's not good, but it's good. Then people say, well, Christy, what if I just do it over at my table, like up here at the teacher desk, and it's not like... Oh, there's a good one. Hold on. What about classroom rewards? I'll come that too. Okay. So, but what if I just bring the kid over to my desk and it's not public any longer? Um, I'm just going to argue that it still is public. Everybody knows why the teacher's calling Miss Christie, uh, but there wouldn't be Miss Christie, um, but Christie up to her desk. And unless it's good news when I get to her desk that I'm like, I'm on track and my behavior is fast. So, 
Still know, even if it's only the positive. Still know, even if it's up at your teacher desk or in a little binder or a little thing. Now, there can be exceptions to all of this, but generally speaking, no. Then you say, well, what about if it's verbal affirmation about good things that the kid is doing? Don't we want to catch a kid being good? A mm, little bit harder here. Because oftentimes when I catch somebody being good, that's what I did right at the beginning. I said, Pam looks ready to learn. Shelly's got her listening ears or doing the right thing by highlighting who's doing the right thing. And so in a way, I'm still publicly shaming whoever isn't. So let's say Miss Sarah isn't sitting crisscross applesauce and I don't say anything. I don't move her clip. I don't say, ah, Sarah, you need to sit still crisscross applesauce. But I say, I like the way Pam is sitting. I notice that Shelly is crisscross applesauce. Indirectly, I'm still saying that Sarah's messing up. I'm still being public. I'm still being a class-wide effort to get you to be all on the same page. And who do I mean by young children? Well, I have this really good organized prefrontal cortex that comes like 25 years later. So I kind of mean anybody less than 25 is young. I also am getting old, so everybody's young. I also mean that early childhood is birth to third grade, but I for sure mean two, three, fours, and fives, right? The, for sure, I mean those people as young children. So young children rarely are motivated, motivated by a token economy system. So this idea that we build up rewards, especially if they're not this star or this unicorn or we're the grizzly bear, so we got grizzly paws. When you accumulate enough paws, then we get a reward. And even if that reward is something really intrinsic, like we get a dance party or we get to high five each other or we get to um, celebrate something together, it's super hard to understand a token economy system. Also, they don't have a concept of time. Also, they have trouble delaying gratification. Also, see where I'm going? So this gets really hard. So it's better intentioned to have a reward system than it is to try to shape behavior that is off track, but it's just a sweeter way to still publicly shame, to still tax the cortex in terms of de uh, delayed gratification, token economy. We're really not motivated by those kind of things when we're young. So that's a lot together if you missed anything. So if you think about older children, um, maybe some of these exceptions can be brought in. But in general, there's things around homework, there's things around um, um, group uh, kind of uh, reward system that just fall flat for young children. And there's a whole bunch of controversy in general about homework. So we can come back to that too as well. But I'm going to go forward a little bit. And if, again, if you get lost in the feed, what in the world do I mean by behavior chart? So public, class-wide or group-wide and highly symbolic. Then we said, well, what if? What if I do, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do this over here? Keep asking yourself, is it still a public display or conversation about people's internal states? Is it still a one size fits all? So even if the whole group is working towards it and is it still highly symbolic or slash requiring delay of gratification, a token economy system that is unmotivating to young children? It gets bad, okay? So now we move on to, but we had good intentions. We were doing this for a good reason. Or there's actually a lot of pressure that we have to do this. So yeah, I know it's cutting out, guys. And uh, sorry, it's my internet here in Michigan. Um, but just stick with me. Or if you need to jump off, I'll share the recording just as soon as possible. Um, so... The idea is, well, I was doing it for a good reason, Christy. So here's a couple of your top reasons why we were using behavior charts in the first place or some iteration of the behavior chart. First and foremost, or maybe just first uh, uh, at all, is we wanted to give kids feedback. People will say all the time, but Christy, I wanted to give the kid real-time feedback about their regulation, about that they were escalating, that we needed to do something different. Okay, beautiful. Self-awareness, totally amazing. To catch a kid before they get into the red or the blue zone, 
fabulous. Reduce those stressors, love it. And to help create this place where we can say, I see it's escalating, it's not going good. Behavior charts. So behavior charts don't accomplish the actual goal. And I've already raised some of the reasons why it doesn't. So first of all, the behavior charts are highly symbolic. So they're actually not giving the kid feedback. They're just this clip that seems to have like its own power about where it's moving and which color it's on. And I don't even understand colors yet. So why would I understand which colors are good, desirable, and which colors aren't? So even though you think it's giving the kid feedback about an internal state, it's highly symbolic and for young children about this guys you need to be really thoughtful about the um, abilities like for today we were talking about um, using zones of regulation and helping kids look at um, charts or uh, not charts but like pictures of behaviors and emotions and being able to identify them and an infant toddler teacher was like I'm going to get pictures of emotions and help kids identify their emotion and it's a system so they get something else highly, highly confusing and unmotivating to most young children. I also took down a note because it's been a while since I've done applied behavior analysis, but my dear friend Barb Avil and I have been kind of picking at it lately. So I thought, why not pick at it one more time? So there's this notice, this thing about immediacy of reinforcement. See, I don't know why, but ABA always has to use these hard words. They're hard for me. It's um, back in the day when Barb and I were at the University of Oregon, we talked a lot about um, consequences and we talked a lot about feedback being timely and immediate in that sense. Like you can't wait later to get the consequence. It needs to be paired. But we also talked about logical and somewhere logical got lost and we just went to, I got to give you feedback right away. But what we notice about immediacy of reinforcement is that oftentimes with the behavior charts, there's actually a requirement to delay sort of the feed. You've moved it in your head but haven't out publicly, which is also okay, but your behavior has changed to them. The longer the delay between the behavior and the reinforcement or the feedback in this case, the harder it is for kids to make a change in their behavior. So it's another reason that we don't want to use behavior charts or reward systems that make kids delay when they actually either A, get the feedback, or B, get the reward or the reinforcement. So I sort of um, mush two things in there about getting time. So again, if you're just joining me, my internet is really poor. And so I'm sorry if it's catching out for you a little bit. Hopefully the recording will be seamless and I'll repost it in YouTube here shortly, okay? So that's one reason that people say we do behavior charts because we want kids to have feedback. Now, second ring, people say, but Christy, we're a PBIS state, we're a PBIS district, we're a PBIS school, positive behavior intervention supports, and we're doing school-wide interventions, and we all are part of the school, and we all have to do this in those um, sort of strategies that work for older students should not be applied directly, even though it's a school-wide intervention. Do the preschool teachers need to be aware of the school-wide interventions for older students and be a part of that consistency? Yes, but we can't take something that we're using for older students and apply it directly to younger students and just say, well, it's PBIS, therefore it should work. Okay, so we'll come back to that and Ashley and I'll show a few things where Lisa Fox and others have talked about about when they're on track. Again, as I started off the start of this recording, if it's public information about somebody's internal state, if it's class-wide, meaning it's a one-size-fits-all, and if it's highly symbolic, even if you're trying to show somebody good behavior, desirable behavior, on-target behavior, it still is that same slippery slope. So I want you to catch kids being good and we can use positive descriptive affirmations but we want to be careful that we're not creating division among children but rather com uh, creating community so if I'm calling out who's being good and just being neutral about who's being bad I'm still creating some sort of division among children so be careful again even if your intention is to catch kids being good then try to use positive descriptive affirmations or PDA plus. 
teach kids the right way to respond. I want to help kids learn self-regulation. Kids need to learn the rules, the rituals, the routines. How else am I going to tell them that they're on track or off track? So if that's your reason for using behavior charts, it's still getting gonna get, it's still going to get bagged, but I want you to understand a couple of things about this idea of self-regulation, this idea of children um, doing the right thing, uh, that you want to be intentional. If a child is already approaching the orange or the red, that's generally what color they are on behavior charts of where I'm going to like um, write you up, send you to the office, alert your parents, some sort of negative thing is going to happen to you you're probably already riding the red train. And so if you've listened to Barb, Avila, and I at all, you know that when a child is hyper-aroused, fight or flight, or hypo-aroused, freeze or faint, maybe they're so confused that you put them in the red that they act. the kicker is they cannot learn the rule, the routine, or the ritual if they're riding the red train. How's that for a big, long alliteration? So again, and Ashley, let people know that if it's cutting out, we're hoping that the recording is seamless, but it's my internet on my end here um, up in rural Michigan. So what we're covering is the kind of reasons behind the use of behavior charts and sort of unpacking why those sound like a good idea, but they fall for the symbolic behavior chart system. My internal state and I need one more hand, and what I should do about it. So it's really complicated. The kid needs to understand your behavior feedback system chart unicorn thing, needs to have good self-awareness of, oh, I am feeling a little bit agitated. Then they need to know what to do about it. Just because my clip got moved doesn't mean I'm like, oh, right, sorry, I'm supposed to be doing, right? So that brings in, they need the guide. What am I feeling? And as our colleague at Seed and So, Alyssa would say, they need time to process through that big emotion, not just go, oh, I'm feeling something big. It's going to get me in trouble. I better squash it. I better stuff it. I better not feel it, right? We need to process through those big emotions and we need someone to help us understand what are those big emotions. And they feel really big to young children. And so how do we um, serve as a guide on the side, even if I haven't flipped my lid, I'm still hugely impacted by this limbic. Right? So just to quickly recap, because I know it's cutting out a little bit. We started off saying, what does Christy mean by behavior charts and why do we want to bag them? So I gave you some criteria of how to say, but do you mean, well, do you mean this? And what about if I do that? And well, what about over here? So I've given you kind of a guidance of how to think about what I mean by bagging behavior charts. Then we said, but Christy, you know, we've got good intentions. We want to give feedback. We're part of PBIS. We want to catch kids being good. We want to be able to teach them to self-regulate. More about what to do, and we'll put them in our show notes also. Because there's other podcasts, there's blogs, there's books, there's courses to the solutions. And so I don't want to shortchange it, but really tonight this was, what do you mean by behavior charts? But we had good intentions, and you still and then what's your number one or number two reason for bagging behavior charts? First of all, to be quite honest, I think it's really just a form of public shaming. And so I feel like we haven't owned up to that. We haven't owned up to that some of our teaching practices just aren't really good for humans. And we do it across the ages. We do it in higher ed, we do it in secondary ed, we do it in your yoga class, we do it in your tennis class. So I really mean this broadly as a community that we need to think about, are we publicly shaming people? Are we creating division and competition where we really want community and co-regulation and interdependence? I would also say that all behavior is communication. I may not always know what you're communicating. I may not always want to hear what you're trying to tell me. You're kind of done. I've had it. I need to go to bed, right? I may need you to keep going, keep learning, keep trying. But when we strip it down and when we talk about all behavior is communication, then we shouldn't try to stop it or cut it off by 
say and we should try to understand what is the thing that you're trying to communicate with me okay so those are my other two reasons why I want to bag behavior charts. I just feel like in general, it's public shaming. We're not building community, compassion, and interdependence. We're kind of breaking our connection to each other. Even that trust and relationship gets a little bit um, tarnished by this sort of public shaming. And then also we want to recognize that all behavior is communication. So Back, then I want you to really think about what is timely, what is logical, what actually gives them something to hold on to, something that is maybe a visual support that is actually supportive. And Ashley and I talk about this in an earlier blog about uh, behavior charts, and we'll be talking about it again in a blog that she's working on. But we want to be clear, if feedback is your goal, then get clear about how you give effective feedback. And that's a whole big, long discussion. If it's people, you need to learn a little bit about what the people that created PBIS are saying about customizing it, tailoring it, changing it for our youngest citizens. If you want to catch kids being good, how can you do that in a way that builds community? How can you do that in a way that is um, really doing positive descriptive affirmations that connect their good action with the greater good. So these are all things that you can uh, Google or that we'll put in the show notes that are about um, and learning through connection. And so we want to do things that forge and foster that connection, not break it apart and get rid of that, all in just to have a bit of compliance. Two. We are externally regulated. That means we need to co-regulate with children. And you need to be able to um, be there as their guide on the side, offer the lifeline, reduce the stressors, find a way to process. So all of that is really, really important that we're focusing on co-regulation before we can expect kids to self-regulate. We also have to actually teach kids how to self-regulate, how to stop, think, and then act. And we can only teach that when they're in that green zone, in the window of tolerance, in that ability to um, hear what it is we're teaching. We also need to be in the business of recognizing and reducing stressors. So we can either keep the kid from escalating by reducing and removing the stressors versus adding rewards or removing rewards. How about the replacement behavior is that we reduce stressors. So educating ourselves on a customized view of each child. What are their stressors? Are there some group-wide? If you want to do anything class-wide, look class-wide of what are your stressors and what they're processing. But certainly it's that social, emotional, all that limbic stuff about all those emotions. How do we help children process them, not just get through them, not just get over them. I sound like I'm going on a bear hunt, don't I? Um, but really um, begin to sit with it, even though it's not the fun things in life to sit with that, but to be um, not in a hurry as kids need to process those big emotions. All right. So I've kept you a long, long time on a Friday night, my fellow revolutionaries. And I was what can we do instead? What are the solutions? And the first solution is always what before how. Get clear on what it is you wanted to do. What was the behavior chart trying to solve? Was it feedback? Was it teaching self-regulation? Was it because of PBIS? Is it because you wanted to catch kids being good? Then start to peel back and find more effective and efficient ways to help children learn self-regulation, to get immediate and, and logical feedback and so forth. And then lastly, keep compliance, kind of reduce stressors, and then allow and help support children through processing of those big emotions. So I hope this is helpful in terms of why we are all about bagging the behavior charts. If you have other questions, put them in the comment section and we'll do our best to get you some answers. So have a fabulous weekend and thanks for everybody who was able to join me live or who listens back later.